everyone. Thanks for coming. This is very exciting to be here. I'm Jenny Kane. I work at uh, Bloomberg Philanthropies. I oversee our career and technical education portfolio. And I'm joined by Jade Grieve. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm, I'm Jade Grieve. I'm the Chief of Student Pathways at New York City Public Schools. So working for the district and overseeing all of our college and career readiness efforts, uh, including this exciting thing we're going to talk about this morning. So we're going to give you a hopefully quickish overview and leave time for discussion and questions. Um, we're excited to present this to you today. So at Bloomberg Philanthropies, we want students to have options and opportunities. But for far too long, students were really only faced with go to four-year college or nothing, really left with nothing. But we also know at the same time that 40% of Americans have a four-year college degree. Um, again, schools overly focused on college preparation, four-year college preparation, with limited help to direct people towards real pathways to careers. Um, and for those who don't get one of these jobs, hourly wage is for a high, with a high school with solely a high school degree is very low and has stagnated for a long time. Um, at the same time, and we've been doing projects in this space since 2016, but what we kept seeing emerge over and over was that healthcare sort of kept coming up as the place where there's a lot of jobs that don't require a four-year BA, you need more than a high school degree, but they're really great pathways for young people. Um, those jobs are around two million, they're, they're um, estimated to grow. By, to 4 million by 2031. There's a significant number of those jobs that are allied health professional jobs that require, again, a credential or certification, but not a four-year degree. Um, and the, this, the systems that we have so far to get young people into these jobs are ineffective and costly. So that was sort of our problem statement that we were coming from. So a little over a year ago, we decided to sort of test out this idea um, to create um, new schools that bring together schools and healthcare systems to create specialized healthcare high schools to prepare students for good jobs. And we define good jobs as leading to a family sustaining wage, having opportunities for growth over time, um, and not being um, and being able to be uh, to, to to exist in the face of sort of, of technology and AI. So we um, developed a deep partnership between employers and educators. We started talking to major hospital systems around the country and said, is this really a problem for you? Do you need this? And every one of the um, hospitals that we spoke to said, yes, we have 5,000 openings. We have 3,000 openings. We're having to close hospital beds. We have to um, hire visiting nurses that are costing 10 times as much. We're really desperate, and we are willing to partner with a, health, with a high school. Um, so basically, what they have committed to is that we are going to do healthcare-focused um, classroom learning. Um, they've all committed to meaningful work-based learning at the health system, paid work experience in 11th and 12th grade, career pathways to the actual specific jobs that they have open, um, and that, uh, that students graduate ready to go into the workforce or post-secondary if they choose. But every single hospital system has committed to hiring every person who graduates through these programs successfully. And that was a big part of what we wanted to accomplish. So this is really a partnership between philanthropy, um, the healthcare systems, and schools. We partner with districts and charter schools around the country. We basically see ourselves as a de-risking agent um, to help bring together groups that might have never worked together before. Many of the hospitals that we spoke to said, I've never worked with the local high school. I have no idea how to. I don't know if it'll be worth it. I don't think they can do it. Um, we were playing matchmaker in a lot of cases, bringing together healthcare systems and school systems. We we're also de-risking the process for them because we were, were basically paying up front to help bring these groups together and figure out how to collaborate. Um, so the upfront funding that we are providing, and it's really between 20 and 30 million for each location, um, is to uh, bu renovate buildings to create spaces for young people to learn healthcare careers, curriculum development, coordination between the partners, as I mentioned, um, initial staffing costs, and incremental school operating costs. And our grant funds are only for the first five years. We have asked the healthcare system to commit funds for the next five years, so they all had to commit on paper their in-kind and financial commitments for both the first five years when we're funding, but the, the next five years when they're on the hook mm -hmm. to continue to fund these programs. We also just helped coordinate on the de design and delivery of the program and came up with our own standards and measurements that we wanted schools to accomplish. 
and we're very focused on sharing best practices. We bring the, the partners together, learn from one another. This is new for everybody. So really have the opportunity to say what works, what didn't work in terms of work-based learning or curriculum design or which pathways works for young people. Um, the private healthcare system, like I said, has to commit in kind and financially. They have to co-create the course of study, identify what the career pathways are that they particularly need, um, and provide ongoing contributions to the school. All the work-based learning in 11th and 12th grade is paid. They are on the hook to teach within the schools and outside of the schools. And they have all committed to paying for all post-secondary education. So if a student starts working in their hospital system, they will pay them to go back to get an additional credential certification, associate's degree, or get a BA to become an RN. Um, so that you know they're doing all the tuition and loan forgiveness for ongoing post-secondary education so that students see this as a long-term stackable opportunity where they continue to gain in terms of wages and also in terms of um, their trajectory within their career. Um, and then they've all committed that they will hire every person that comes out of the program successfully completes the program. Um, we, we rely on our education partners, which we, we define as K-12 and higher ed because we work very closely with many community colleges. Honestly, every group that we're working with has a community college partner that is has been working with the hospital system on the credentialing and training program. Um, and they work within the high school on an early college or year 13 model. Um, but basically, they are ensuring that students that have these opportunities within their school day, they obviously were getting the per pupil funding flowing through those school systems. And they also are leveraging additional funding to support CT grant, you know, programs like through CT grants. Um, and they lead the day to day operation of the schools and engage the students and families. So we're in sort of phase one. We have 10, which I'll describe on the next slide, 10 sites that we're working in. We have four launching this fall. So in the first phase, we want to test and prove out this model. Um, and we want to see if it actually is meeting the needs of the healthcare systems. If they see an ROI, if they see this as a successful mechanism, is it successful for students? Are they wanting to be in this program? Are they going into careers? Um, we are heavily evaluating the program and, as I said, bringing together partners and sharing best practices so that others can learn from what's working and what's not. And then hopefully our phase two is that we will scale these programs. Um, obviously our hope is maybe hospital systems around the country will see this and do it on their own. We're likely going to um, invest additional philanthropic funds in this as well. Um, but not only to apply to healthcare, but perhaps other industries where there's a lot of jobs with a very specific training that doesn't need a four-year BA, like microchip processing or electric vehicles, some other industries that have come up and that have a lot of available jobs. Um, this is just a little description of the 10 geographies that were selected. We did a very robust RFP process last summer and selected these 10 sites. Um, as you can see, it's a mix of district and charter schools, but what is in common is that the healthcare system that is the partner is either the biggest employer in that location or one of the biggest employers in that location, and each of them have thousands of open jobs that do not require um, a four-year degree. So Boston, Charlotte, Dallas, Demopolis, Alabama, which is a rural model because we know that there's a really big need for rural healthcare workers, and students in rural areas often get um, overlooked for these types of opportunities. Um, Durham, Houston, Nashville, New York City, which we're gonna talk about today. Northeast Tennessee, which is also a rural model with ballot health, and Philadelphia. Um, you can again see that there's a, there's a very diverse cohort, which we hope will give us a lot of learnings about what, what works in each of the places and what might be distinctive that it, it provides a benefit for the locations, but it's a you know, mix of metro and rural, charter and district. Some of them are schools that exist already, like EMK, Edward M. Kennedy School in Boston is an existing healthcare-focused school that really had no relationship to Mass General, which is the biggest employer there, and bringing them together so that Mass General is going to train and hire the young people, not just provide um, you know, one-off days where they come in and, and, and give an overview. Um, and some of them are net new schools that are being built um, or a building is being reallocated for this school. So it's a mix, so we'll see which one is sort of more successful. 
Um, some of them have a grade 13 model. Often that's in places where they have a really good early college model or year 13 model already. Um, for example, in Durham, they're partnering with Carolina's Health School Health College, and they're actually going to college in 11th, 12th, and 13th grade, in grade 13, and they're getting advanced degrees so they can go into even higher paying jobs like radiology technician. Um, and that's also in, in Durham. It, the school is actually going to be at a community college called Durham Tech. It's going to be on its campus so that students can take those college level courses while they're in high school. I'm going to now turn it over to Jay to talk more specifically about our partnership in New York City. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, yeah, I'm excited to give you a chance to like take a closer look in to what this looks like in one of the 10 communities that, that Jenny um, shared just before. And so as you can see on the slide here, this is, a, um, this is a partnership between New York City Public Schools, who I'm representing, and Northwell Health. So um, unfortunately, there's not a third person on the stage. We couldn't get the Northwell Health rep um, here today. Um, but, but it is truly a, a deep partnership and collaboration between our two institutions. Um, and so just to give you some context, New York City Public Schools, uh, we are the largest district in the nation. Uh, we serve uh, close to a million students across um, about 1,800 schools, uh, so, so very large. Uh, and um, what, what we've set up under this, uh, this administration, this chancellor, is real clarity around the goal and how we want to make sure we're preparing young people. And so actually the agency's mission was updated uh, just over two years ago to really clarify that our goal is to make sure that every student who comes to our schools leaves us prepared and on a pathway to a rewarding career and long-term economic security. So that's a, that's a big um, shift in the statement, a really important one, to meet uh, what students need, their opportunities going forward, and how we're making sure we're preparing and connecting them to strong post-secondary paths. And so, as you can see, like there's a very strong connection between what, what we're seeking to do and the way in which this initiative from Bloomberg Philanthropies is going to help us unlock that um, in this particular school. Um, as part of that, just over two years ago, we launched an initiative called Future Ready, which is a new program. It's across 100 high schools um, today, growing next year. Um, and that's really bringing the best of the early college models and early um, uh, CTE models that have existed uh, for a long time, but have tended to exist in just some schools for some students. And so we saw a real opportunity to take the, the learnings and the insights and to blend that um, and to make that accessible and available to students across all schools, regardless of school type, so that we are really able to meet this mission that the Chancellor has set. And so what that looks like in a school, just to give you a sense, is that schools, high schools are blending um, early career opportunities, which means like early exposure, career discovery days, job, job um, shadowing, kind of career panels, that kind of thing, through into paid work-based learning in the, in the later grades. It's integrating uh, in, in themes of uh, industry areas where we know there's lots of opportunity in the labor market, but often ones that students aren't able to kind of get their foot in the door and access. Uh, and where those, those industries and businesses are saying, we need more talent. Uh, and we want to make sure we have a diverse, uh, diverse workforce. Um, so industries like uh, technology, business and finance and education is where we started, and healthcare. Um, so this has been a really good fit um, for where, where, where we're growing this program. Um, and then students are also kind of through the prism of those industries. They're getting access to early college credit, credentials, um, industry credentials where that's relevant, and making sure all those experiences are being designed and woven in a way that is helping them build a really strong personalized plan for where they plan to go after school. And so, you know, we have a lot going on across the school district um, in this space, but I, I raise that because um, Northwell Health were an anchor partner for us in that program in healthcare, and has been very much the foundation on which, and on which this partnership has been built. Um, just to um, uh, do my friends at Northwell Health um, some justice here, hopefully, um, Northwell Health is um, actually, I think it's New York, New York State's largest private employer. Um, certainly the largest healthcare and hospital system um, in the state and in the city. Uh, they treat annually 2 million New Yorkers and provide over 700 million in community benefits. Um, as, a, as an institution, and their, their leadership really speaks to this, they are deeply committed to education, um, both education uh, in how that impacts community health, but of course in terms of like workforce opportunities as well. So they're a very large network, have lots of different um, hospitals and healthcare um, uh, practices like right across the city, and so that, that created an opportunity for us to think about um, uh, where we might locate that proximate to Northwell Health um, facilities. 
So giving you a sense of like the organizations kind of who, who've come together here, um, I think it's worth just for a second, and this relates to some of the things that Jenny shared too, the challenge I think that we are trying to play into and to solve and, and I think recognize, and I'm sure there are statistics that look very much like this in all of the cities and states that, that, that you come from. Um, but but to, get, to put a really fine point on it, uh, we know we're losing too many people through the education to work pipeline. That is in part what this initiative and the work of Future Ready and our partnership is designed to solve. But when we've looked at the most recent graduating class of ninth graders and we follow them through to high school graduation, we follow them through six years after high school graduation, we see all in only about 33% of students are actually getting a two or a four year degree six years after school. And then if you think about then who's in that category and who's not in that category, it doesn't reflect the population of the school students that we serve. It is not equitable who's getting the degree. And I think we'd all agree that those numbers to start with are insufficient based on all the things we hear about how skills are kind of leveling up expectations in the job market, the kinds of experiences you need to get your foot in the door. Um, and, so, and so, so that is really one thing that we have paid close attention to and I think is why these partnerships between the school system uh, and higher education and workforce are so critical because, because if you wait to college or if you wait till after college, you've lost a lot of young people along the way uh, and, who, and, and it's not equitable kind of who's staying in that pipeline. Um, so, that, so on the school side, that's why this is so important to us. I think as Jenny shared, um, uh, about kind of the broad healthcare um, system, for it's the same is true in New York City. Uh, healthcare jobs are expected to, to grow um, uh, by 26% 26, 26 by 2030, so that's big growth. Um, I think we kind of all, all know um, the reasons why that is and, and see that in our own, um, our own geographies. But specifically what this initiative and the partnership and as we were developing the school together, what it helped crystallize is, is something that also is often hard to get your hands on, the specific um, numbers of vacancies that businesses are expecting. And so I think that's a really important part of how the design process that the um, Bloomberg Philanthropy set up helped us kind of uh, understand. And so you can see here on the slide the kind of immediate needs that Northwell Health has in the healthcare system. Um, estimated 7,000 openings per year in nursing, uh, 1,200 in diagnostic medicine, physical therapy and behavioral health. Uh, and so the, these are the things that we are then designing the programs and pathways to, to meet the need of very specifically. Um, and then lastly, I think the, um, d just to say, I think we, you know, we pay a lot of attention to where there is um, opportunity and need across the city. And we saw um, in Queens specifically both a need for additional high school seats, but also as we looked at our career connected programming, we could see very clearly that there was insufficient kind of healthcare opportunities in that place, yet a lot of healthcare systems kind of in Queens. Um, and this, is, this, this will be opened um, in one of the most diverse districts that we have uh, in the city uh, and is really going to fill a gap in terms of programming to connect to the kinds of post-secondary and career opportunities that will exist. Um, this is a real rendering. This is what this, the campus is going to look like. Um, we're building a new campus that this school will be housed in. This is going to be an incredible facility. It will be a, the whole campus will be a career connected uh, campus. So we'll have two other uh, schools that are going into that campus alongside Northwell Health. Um, but I think just to like name some of the things that, re that, that we're really excited about in this partnership and the way in which um, this is developed with Northwell. Um, uh, firstly, just to say, like, I mean, I've been involved in, in work like this for many years. This is the deepest partnership we've had with an employer that I've seen in K-12 with an employer. And they are at the table designing with us um, as we kind of go into, the, into launch. Um, every aspect of the school development, which, which is not how it always is, that they're helping us kind of think through curriculum, they're bringing many of their staff um, and their industry experts to the table to do that. They're also helping us think through um, utilization of space and design of classrooms in the school, like when, and, and thinking about what are the particular um, uh, simulation equipment and like what equipment should we be using um, in our simulation lab. And so I think all of those different components aren't always baked in from the start, and I think that's what we've had the chance to do here with, um, with Northwell. And then, uh, based on the needs of those four industry areas you saw on the slide before, we're going to work with them and backwards map. Well, if you, if you want to be a nurse, what are the things that need to be in place kind of in the years before? What are the skills, the credentials, the experiences? And we'll build the school around that. Secondly, 
uh, this will be a, a healthcare hub. So this is, um, you know, as you heard up front, like we have almost 2,000 schools. So we think both this is going to be the, um, you know, an, an incredible kind of lighthouse model of what, of what this can look like at its best. And we want to make sure we can think about how do we get more students and educators access to the kinds of facilities um, and industry experts that are going to be proximate and inside this school. So ways in which we can leverage the simulation lab for training for students and for teachers um, for other schools that have high, uh, healthcare focused programs. Um, and then lastly, I think, and Jenny spoke to some of this, but I think what Northwell have committed to as part of this is really significant. So they will change their tuition reimbursement policy. So if a student chooses to take a job at Northwell after high school graduation, um, or by choice, based on their interest, uh, they, will have, um, they will have on day one access to the tuition reimbursement um, program. Usually you have to wait a year, that's pretty common. Um, this I think is really gonna unlock for students that true like earn and learn college and career pathway at the same time. Um, they're also involved in some of our, like how we think about the, like, some of the advising initiatives. Um, they've also committed to provide clinical internships for every single student who'll be at this school. Um, and so at full uh, capacity, this school is gonna be eight or 900 students. So that's about 200 students a year. And that's, as many of you would know, if you've uh, been involved in, in kind of this space and healthcare pathways, that's a really significant thing to kind of like open up. And so that's a, a major development from Northwell and I think is just gonna create incredible opportunities for students to um, have those experiences and truly be ready if they want to take that pathway after school. Um, two, two last slides we have here just to give you a sense because we wanted to leave some time for, for questions. Um, uh, as you saw, kind of Northwell identified where are the highest priority kind of needs and opportunities that students can, um, can take uh, uh, into the work, healthcare workforce if they're interested. And so the pathways that the school will offer will be built around those. So we're building four pathways um, that will exist in the school. Uh, nursing, what you can see there is how we've really tried to think through like what's the entry level position and then where are they heading after that? We want to make sure that this, as Jenny said, like these are stackable options. You can keep following the path. You can continue to level up through education to kind of improve your career and, uh, and just continue to grow in the field. Uh, and so nursing will be one. Um, and we've you know, wanted to be very clear about like what the uh, wage options are for students and where they can take that. Diagnostic medicine, which many of you probably know. Um, and then just to call out, uh, so, so nursing and diagnostic medicine we have across the city already. Physical therapy we do, but it actually looks more like kind of fitness than physical therapy or rehabilitation aid, and that's changing in terms of our workforce needs, so we will be building a new program for that. And behavioral health, I think, coming out of the pandemic and the need for more social work, and uh, we actually don't have a program in schools that, um, that meets this need. That's true in the city, that's true in the state, so this will be a first-time pathway that we're building with Northwell. Um, there is a lot happening on this, <laughs> but the, the idea is to give you a sense of um, the way in which uh, a, a, a student's experience in this school will look different. So yes, they're going to be in your traditional 9th, 10th, 11th and 12th grades and kind of progress through, but you can see that we're sequencing the kind of career-connected instruction, so they'll be doing healthcare uh, courses inside school, they will be um, doing uh, uh, early college uh, credits, things like anatomy and physiology, some of those kind of gating and really important um, course credits to get going into college. Um, they'll have the option to be taking those credentials of value, like a certified medical assistant. Um, they're getting work-based learning, which is more kind of exposure in the early grades and then building into paid experiences. And then you can see really clearly here that it gives students these, um, these very um, kind of clear and compelling pathways. They can go right into career and Northwell hope to hire a number of students who come, who come out of this school. Um, they can go directly onto college and they will have um, cre uh, college credits under their belt, they'll have credentials, um, or they can do both because of some of the innovations in Northwell's um, tuition reimbursement design. So that's all really intentionally designed um, so that students truly have those three options before them and it's clear how you, how you kind of take that credit and move into college, how you, which, what are the stepping stone jobs and where you can go from there. Um, and so we're really excited about, um, a, a, about this school and what it's going to represent and how it will kind of push not just the field of pathways forward, but I do think push the way in which employers are engaging uh, with, with high schools, with colleges around um, the, the kind of depth and importance of this work. And then lastly, just to say, we, you know, this, this school, um, we've got some planning time um, uh, ahead of us. So the, actually the, uh, the job description for the principal is kind of currently out and we are recruiting a principal right now, which is really exciting. Um, but the school will open in September, 2025. 
So that's, um, that is our presentation. We wanted to just give you a bit of um, context and, 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 and detail about what this looks like and then wanted to make sure that we had um, time for any of your questions. For enrolment, um, so this will be part of our um, part of our like choice enrolment system across uh, across the city. So students will be able to en enrol and choose to opt in, and we have a process for managing that. And this will look like we will follow the same process there. Um, but we're also got there will be some criteria around that to make sure that we are getting students from Queens. Um, so there'll be some priorities around um, uh, geographic like distribution and making sure that the population of students that ultimately um, get selected for the school represent the diversity of the school the um, city's. Um, economic need characteristics, so those things will be factored in, but it will be part of kind of the, the regular um, high school application process. I think what it, um, maybe just one other thing to add to that, I think what it will be important for us to do as we're leading up to September 2025 is make sure that students and families, particularly in and around Queens, understand this option when they're in middle school. I think this, you know, they, these are incredible opportunities. We want to make sure students and families know about it and they have kind of the time to like think through that decision making process, especially as this is just such a rich opportunity and kind of pathway. So I think it really does up the ante on how we're preparing young people in middle school and their families around high school selection. We have many in our school system as well, and one of the things we've learned over the decade is that the industry partnerships really do shift over time. A major anchor partner will suddenly no longer be present. How do you factor that into your program design up front so that you have flexibility built in on the back end knowing that things evolve? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think one thing is, like, to that point, we required the healthcare systems to commit to 10 years on paper as part of their grant agreement and not just say, we'll do it, but just say exactly how much they're committing. Um, each one of them is committing between usually two, and three, two to three million a year after the program. Now, that doesn't mean that there might be shifts in leadership um, or you know, shifts in priorities of those leaders, but I think as intentional as we could be to make sure that they were bought in and they saw this from a business perspective, not a philanthropic perspective, this is not meant to be like, part of your um, you know, social responsibility office. This is meant to be part of your HR play, that you're getting talent from this. We also built a lot of ROI models for them to show how they were going to save money over time and mm -hmm. how they were going to increase talent that they presented to their boards yeah. and that we will continue to work on with them so that they can maintain the momentum of committing to the project. I would just add really quickly, all of that is true in our case too, and I, I don't think I said it, but this school actually is going to be called the Northwell um, School of Health Sciences. So they have I think to. that's also a really important <laughs> part of it. <laughs> For courses like anatomy and physiology and pharmacology, will the staff come from the hospital to teach those courses, and how is the State Department of Education credentializing them, or what kind of uh, different systems that they put in place for the teacher education component in the traditional schools. So there'll be, um, there'll be, I guess, two parts of where students are getting access to those kinds of courses. One will be they're actually in, early, they're already enrolled in college while they're with us in, in high school. So like anatomy and physiology is probably taught by um, an, an industry professional kind of professor who's at the college. Um, in terms of the Northwell partnership, I think one, we're really excited to spend the time between now and September 2025 to think about ways we can innovate on that. Certainly there are options and we have capacity already in, um, in existing kind of contracts and agreements to have guest lecturers, uh, that kind of model. And I think there's lots of opportunity to think about how do we take that forward. Um, you know, one thing that, you know, Northwell, just because they've been so involved with us, are also thinking about, like, how can we help um, <clears throat> bring some of our industry experts to not just this school and educators in this school, but educators who are offering healthcare programs in other places, so they're already starting to think about that. Um, I think there's some other innovations that we're talking about that um, kind of aren't ready for main stage yet, but I, I, I do think there's ways in which we can, because of the depth of the partnership, um, and, I, and I think the, the thing I'm just calling out there is like part of it is like, you know, the, the way in which industry professionals come into the classroom for students, but also for educators themselves too, in terms of being able to go, go into Northwell and learn about um, just seeing kind of contemporary practice and having the chance to have those professional exchanges. So I think it, re it really is about all of those different components. The professional development for the teachers yep. too, in conjunction with Northwell. 
Yeah, here first. Yeah, are there any opportunities to add more sites to mm -hmm. phase one? Well, phase one I is thought that phase would be the one, first question. right? <laughs> but there is opportunity for more sites in phase two, which we have not yet decided the timing of, but there is definitely um, interest internally to do more based on how many people reached out to us after we announced this. Um, and the express interest, particularly from the hospital side, to say we want to do this, we, we are desperate for workers. So yes, we are taking all inquiries and we will let people know when that time comes. Thank you. I would be curious, um, and I really appreciate the fact that you are building a high school, but I'm curious if any of your models have um, uh, students that are present in a healthcare setting and using the healthcare facilities um, as their school. So I mm -hmm. would, I would mm. ask that. Yeah, I mean, most of them are in 11th and 12th grade, as we said, you have a paid work experience at the hospital. So you're in the hospital a lot. But most of the um, actual physical buildings are either buildings that were used by another school that are being converted to use for this school and um, community colleges that focus on healthcare like Durham Tech and Carolina's College for Health Sciences are two examples where they're already doing the credentialing and certification for the hospital system, and students are going to have high school there. So they're going to be college students, basically, in 11th and 12th. It's a good idea. Like, we definitely ask a lot of hospital systems, like, do you have extra space? Like, could we come here and do it? Oftentimes, that, that was really not an option, but they have committed to really maximizing the time that they spend within their healthcare systems, particularly in 11th, 12th, and some in year 13. Hi, I'm um, just curious about um, how you integrate student, um, parent, and community voice in the early iteration and design yeah. of the uh, high schools. Yeah, I mean, one thing we did was like a tremendous amount of polling in each place to say, is this a, something of interest to you? And it was like probably the most positive, overwhelming polling we've ever done <laughs> in terms of across political lines, across you know, every, every sort of way you could split it. Um, and we basically started by going to the school system and saying, is this something that parents and students are interested in? And they themselves did a lot of focus groups and talked to their parents and students to say, if we offer this, would you be interested? So we definitely built that in on the forefront, like right at the beginning. And then many of the schools did a lot of focus groups as we before we were launching to let folks know that this is the way that the school that the school was going and to get their feedback on what specific pathways were to be offered, what you know opportunities was nursing a really big part. A lot of uh, the sites are doing a partnership with a um, university offering a BA, so students can go directly into nursing. Um, that's in, in Boston, their school is going to be with BU, so you can just go right into the nursing program. So we um, were very intentional both before this program was announced, um, or before the program was even put together, that this was something that students and parents wanted in each place. And then as we were rolling it out, that students and parents felt involved and um, kept in the loop as, as the schools were either changing or announcing new schools. I can just add quickly for us, I think the um, part of the benefit of having a principal selected so early in the process will allow them and the superintendents to engage um, with parents, with students and the communities as they're building and designing. Uh, and obviously we'll be doing that too as part of the design process with Northwell uh, over the coming months. Um, and, and then the last thing to say just, as I visit lots of schools and you talk to students, so many of them want to be in the healthcare industry. I think that's probably partly a post-pandemic um, uh, fact and kind of a, a, an impact, but they see themselves as wanting to give back. They want to give back specifically to their communities. And so I think this is a really important part of, of creating one of those options close to home for many students in Queens. Exactly where the jobs will be. Does that like result in sort of 
wait-and-see approach, or is it, no, let's try to get ahead of it and support kids in getting into those pathways? Yeah, I think it's a little bit more of the wait-and-see, yeah. particularly in an industry where we're really not sure where the jobs are. I think a project like this really only works where there's a really concentrated amount of jobs right. that have very specific outlined requirements. And we don't really know those yet in a lot of industries. We are working in microchip with Intel in Columbus in another one of our programs. So we are trying out different industries, just not exactly this specific model. I think we would definitely be open to it, but I think that the key of knowing where exactly the jobs are and the requirements would have to be there. Yeah. Do any of your sites look more than one school district? Yes. Yeah. So, well, in um, rural, in Northeast Tennessee, because it's a rural geography, there's six schools in a district um, that are doing a hybrid model where they're gonna be at Ballad Health, which is the hospital system, but also work within their like, local communities and do some online work because they're so spread out. So that is a model that we're testing in the vein of testing different things for a rural geography where like, we know that students need it and the community needs healthcare workers. Mm -hmm. um, so that, and, and the model actually in um, rural Alabama is a residential model, which takes students from around the state. And then they go back into their communities to work. Hi. Oh, sorry. Hi. Um, thank you so much for this amazing presentation. My name is Natalie, and I'm the co-founder and executive director of Homeworks Trenton. We are bringing boarding schools, the boarding school experience to public schools for high school girls in marginalized communities. Um, and again, thank you for, this is an amazing project. And I think especially just working in the Trenton School District, I know and have seen firsthand how hard it is for innovation to kind of come into traditional you know, public school districts. And I'm just wondering, you know, just based on the pre-work that you've done, how scalable, you know, how do you see this as the future of schools and how scalable is this model? Well, I definitely think private philanthropy has a big role to play to incentivize people to get together and to de-risk the project. Like you said, it's really hard to do these things because people have so many other commitments and responsibilities. We, we, you know, the, the, all the groups we spoke to said, oh yeah, we'd love to do that, but we have like 10,000 things in our strategic plan that we're working on right now, and if we are not incentivizing them by providing them support in terms of developing the program and hiring, it's not gonna happen. And I hope that's not the case everywhere, but you know, our hope is that if we can codify enough information as to what works, and you know, present information in a clear manner that, that really for each kind of district, because we're trying out different models, that it will help facilitate this. And I hope other pro private industry sees this and says, I wanna do that, I need more workers. So they'll be incentivized on their own to take it on. I, I would maybe just add, I mean, when I mentioned uh, at the front, um, the initiative that we launched Future Ready, that's in 100 high schools just in its second year. We think this is a really important part of what the future of education looks like. There, it, it, there is clear evidence on the importance of um, work experience for, for young people, on the impact that um, early college credit can have on not just enrolling, but completing and being successful in post-secondary. These are the things that evidence tells us matters for young people. Uh, and young people are telling us that themselves too. They want to have these experiences. They want to, to be kind of solving real world problems. They want um, education to explain for them how it's going to prepare them for their future and set them up well. Uh, and so I think this kind of design and model is, is, is very much designed to, to address that in addition to obviously the important connection between education and workforce and building a really strong and equitable talent pipeline. So um, certainly like we've, we've kind of all still got a long way to go in that respect, but I do think this, um, this, this, this really is, I think, the, the, the direction we need to head. And I think having some uh, examples of this kind of at its best, I think really does make a difference for other, other schools to model and to build from. Yeah, my, my question actually picks back right on what you were saying. So I'm a superintendent of a small school district in Central Washington State. Uh, we started an innovation center and it has a health science uh, career pathway. And by starting from the ground up, not having to redesign something, we took the opportunity to really change the instructional model. So it's a mastery based program, it's project based. The teachers aren't called teachers, they're called designers because they co-design projects with students, but help the students understand, all right, we're gonna have to bring in the English standards here. We're gonna have to bring in math and science. So how does that project, and, and kind of expand the project. So 
I was just wondering about the instructional model, uh, on, and it, I'm sure it's not the same across all the 10 sites, but is there some talk about having it be more project-based, uh, not having kids go first period to English, second period to science, but having it be integrated and, and really look, taking the opportunity to kind of change the instructional model and, and make it more relevant for students? Yeah. Um, well, I can answer that first yeah. if you want to add anything. Uh, one thing I'd say, we, we're still at the very start of this, of this process, but I, I definitely think that is kind of ahead of us in the design. And we've got some runway with some of the future ready schools that have been doing this for you know, on, only a year and a half so far. But certainly one thing that we're, we're finding, and I see Kathleen Mathers from ESG is, is here with us, who's also um, partnering with us on Future Ready, is that as we bring more of the career-connected curriculum into schools, it's not like a given that that actually kind of is all of those things you described. Um, and so how do we meet the kind of need in terms of bringing, like making sure students are getting that industry relevant experience and meeting those standards, but that it, it really does live in an applied way. Um, and what are the different ways in which we can think about use of schedule and just different, now every state and every city kind of has different requirements around that. And so I think that's kind of um, either for, for some that's like a real opportunity or, or some of the challenge, but that, that's really what we're driving in the future ready schools. And I think a place that this school can also have a lot of uh, contribution to how we can um, how we can make that kind of live and feel really relevant for young people, but I think all of the ingredients are there, and I think there's you know as you're articulating, we we still really need some more examples of that, but I think this is a great opportunity to do that. Yeah, thank you all so much for coming, and we can stick around in the hallway if you have other questions. <laughs>